Mishka Shabali is catching up with friends who are arguably more talented than him. Hi ho, Mishka Shabali here. Uh, hey, what's up, gang? I feel like it's been an eternity since I've been recording one of these. Um, I got the COVID. <laughs> I uh, I haven't been sick in two and a half years. Two and a half years, maybe even three years. Jesus. Um, since the last time I was touring the UK uh, in 2019 with Hack and Joby. And I got super sick. And um, holy fuck. The, I mean, I have a lot to say on the subject of COVID. The boy did not disappoint. Um, it, I would compare it to a... Uh, a mushroom trip or something like that, where you're like, um, you buy the thing, you eat the thing, and you're then you're sort of like, oh, I don't, I don't know if this is gonna work. I don't know if this is gonna happen. The um, and then you're like, oh, I, I I start to feel a little something, and then you're like, oh, fuck, here we go, and it just then it moves so thick and so fast for a while that <clears throat> it's sort of hard to difficult to parse or difficult to track because you get so fucked up. Um, I had, a like a tickle in my throat. Um, and then I was sort of feeling a little weird and spacey at, at the Kroger. And, um, and then the next day I was like really sick and the, and my friend Rad was like, oh, it gets worse. And it did. Uh, yeah. Just uh, real, real, real sick. The, um, coughed hard enough in the shower that I puked and the and I thought okay this is this is the perigee um and then the next day I was laying on the floor coughing so hard I shit my pants um so yeah real good time with that COVID uh 10 out of 10 recommend um what I would say to people who haven't had it yet is that I think a lot of us have developed this air of inevitability of like oh I I know I'm gonna get it sooner or later don't think that way there's nothing that says that you have to get it sooner or later. You may just never get it. Hold tight to that fantasy, that um, that liberal pipe dream that you may never get COVID if you continue to use masks and hand sanitizer and get your fucking shots and stay out of raves. Um, it's worth not getting it. It um it really sucked. It's fucked with my head. It's still fucking with my head. I still, you know, 10 days later, I have a pretty bad cough. And uh, multiple times throughout the podcast, I would sort of like signal at Lou, like, oh, okay, I got to lay down again. You know, the, I just don't have any energy. Um, so yeah, if you can, if you can not get it, uh, don't get it. Just don't get it. Um, for today's podcast, I recorded with uh, my old friend Lou Poster. Uh, Lou Poster was the principal songwriter and architect for the band Grafton, and uh, now he has a new band called Driftmouth, um, newish band, uh, a band that feels new to me, where I'm so old. Um, I, I love Lou. I, I I really love Lou a lot. The we've gotten to be a lot closer in the last couple of years. Um, we've done a bunch of touring together, and uh, I've been out here in Athens, Ohio, uh, staying at the little cabin on his property. And it's been real funny because the you know when you're sick, you uh, you retreat into TV and your phone, and the memories keep coming up on my phone from uh, last year of like going on a hike with Lou and Donna. Cause I was out here this time last year with their dog pie who has since died and their cat Mixon, who came on the hike with us, like just the, you know, weird little happy family hiking through the woods and, um, the chickens hopping up on my legs and shit like that. And then <laughs> I think two years ago at this time as well, um, I was hanging out with them and then three years ago too, um, my friend Scott Winland, uh, got married. So I was in town. So we have, you know, pictures, pictures of us boating together and whatnot. The, um, I'm, I didn't have Lou on the podcast cause he's my friend though. Um, I, he's really a, 
a profoundly talented talented songwriter um and sadly as it turns out uh, a profoundly talented writer as well um i love his voice i love his songwriting he does one of those things that i think is really hard to do which is to to write sort of hooky country rock songs that don't sound like fucking beer commercials or um that they're uh, gearing up to be line dances or um to sell you something um he also doesn't he doesn't do a thing that i think a lot of country or roots songwriters do where they write about um the lives of working people with uh rose colored glasses or with uh condescension um you know my friend Christine Levine has taken some pretty righteous swipes at Bruce Springsteen as being a, a chubby chaser of the working class um, that uh, he sees those lives, uses those lives as um, grist for the mill. Um, he exploits them without inhabiting them. Um, but that's the world that Lou comes from, and those are his people that is his tradition. Um, and it's, it's really amazing to see such a gifted songwriter, um, doing such high level work on his life's great subject. Um, so yeah, please enjoy this, uh, sort of erratic <laughs> broken up podcast. Uh, the, Lots of coughing here and hemming and hawing and us forgetting our phones are on because uh, after I got COVID, I gave Lou COVID. And uh, what are friends for if not to uh, not to drag you down with them? Anyway, enjoy this one, and uh, hopefully the next one's a little little less gravelly. Sounds like a good time. Yeah. Um, holy shit, dude. I, this, I've never gone into one of these as brain dead as I am right now. The, I probably have more, uh, if not more, more history, more narrative with you than anybody else I've ever had. And I, I can't think of a single fucking thing that we're going to talk about today. Welcome to post COVID in the holler, bud. The, yeah, there's uh, oh, the home sweet COVID. Mm-hmm. The, um, I mean, I'll pick this up in the header a little bit, but yeah, for the last uh, week or 10 days, I have been uh, in Athens, Ohio. Uh, this is my uh, quote unquote vacation. Um, uh, laying flat on my back on the couch in the, the plague cabin. Uh, at my buddy Lou Poster's place uh, with fucking COVID. Um, so this is our first uh, first show back with uh, uh, ever incre- increasingly lower expectations, diminishing expectations, further diminishing expectations. We're, lo- we're lowering the low bar. The light at the end of the tunnel is getting dimmer. There's a light at the end of the tunnel, and when you see it, it means that you're dead. <laughs> Uh, Lou Poster, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, buddy. <laughs> um, how do we know each other? Uh, well, I think that the first time that I met you, I was playing a, uh, a blackout fest at the union and, uh, I had loaded all my gear out onto the sidewalk and at that time it was like a half stack and a bunch of junk. Was it like a, a PV half stack or something? <laughs> the, no, I think the, by that time PV I had butcher. upgraded <laughs> from my crate PV days up to, uh, I think I had a, that super lead at that time. But um, I was standing there talking to Scott Winlin, and I looked over my shoulder, and this giant dude swoops up all of my gear, like underneath these two giant monkey arms, and just walks them all the way up the stairs to the top of the union. And I was like, uh, who just took all my gear upstairs? And Scott goes, oh, that's Mishka. And I was like, I need to make friends with that guy right now. 
dear reader, if you are just tuning in, I am those monkey arms. <laughs> <laughs> those monkey arms are me. <laughs> um, it's funny because the I feel like no, that can't be right. That can't be right. The we got we have to fact check this because my first memory of you is being at the office at Lux in Williamsburg in 2002, 2003. Oh, yeah. And somebody called up and um, was like, uh, uh, hey, my my band needs a show. And I was like, yeah, fucking every band needs a show. The, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know, send me a CD or whatever, you know, like, what kind of band are you? And you, you said, uh, you know, just your typical... Uh, you know, drink whiskey, shoot speed, rock and roll. And I was like, all right, how about a Thursday? <laughs> like, <laughs> that is true. I, I do believe we met on the phone uh, prior to that. And I, I'm i pretty sure that you were at the show that you did book for us that first time. I think so, yeah. Um, but that, those I are do hazy, remember, hazy I, I do remember. I do remember a moment on the sidewalk out in front of the union, though, with a look, you having a look of sort of... Uh, Unin- uninformed sort of general panic in your face of like <laughs> the and the I, cuz I knew that we knew each other right and the I, I, I think uh I don't know I, I was I was shorter when I was like sitting down behind the fucking the doorman's <laughs> That's podium true, yeah. or whatever the right. fuck um the but you're doing something Dramatic, you, you know, you're doing something as a songwriter dramatically different than what you were doing with Grafton, or or maybe not dramatically different. I don't know. It feels different. The tell me about the origin of Driftmouth. How um, how did that band come? You know, what is that band? Who is that band? How did that band come about? What were what what kind of vehicle did you intend for it to be? Um, and you know, and what did it become? Well, it's definitely a, a different delivery system for primarily the same message, I guess. Um, that band started as a gift, uh, actually. My my father retired from the coal mines after 37 years. And because I was in Grafton, I didn't have any money. So I couldn't give him a retirement gift uh, that I thought was fitting for that. So Brad Sunyarski and I got together. And I had written a few songs, and we cribbed together a couple of covers, uh, just kind of about the coal mines, and uh, put together a, a record for him. And that was that was my retirement gift to my dad. And I gave it to him in 2005. Uh, and Grafton was still touring up until, you know, 08 or 09. And I didn't really think about that music too much. And it was just by accident, kind of, that I came back to it several years later and I I listened to it and I thought, hey man, this isn't the worst thing I ever did. Like some of these songs are intelligible and you can tell what I'm you know, what I mean and whatever. Some decent melodies in there. So I got back together with Brad and we put together a, a band around those songs and that became Drift Mouth. In general I, I want to point out to people that starting a band for, for as a gift to another person is a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> Don't don't ever do that. The I mean, it sounds like your dad kind of had it coming, but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's another it, yeah. podcast. The <laughs> one of the many things I I don't like about you is that you you come from a place. You are of a place. You you um the we were talking about this the other night when you were shit faced in the van and you were like, you know who you are, and the I would counter to you that you know where you come from. You know the um. Grafton, of course, named after is it the town you were born in or the town you were raised in it's, in West Virginia. It's the next town over from where I grew up. Um, and it's just a place that we would go. Was that, was that the big town? Take acid and lay it on the rocks. Actually, it was it was a more out town than the one that I was from. So oh, it was okay. actually a smaller town. Uh, but Grafton had a, a place called Valley Falls. And when the dam was up, the water would come down. And you could go out on the rocks in the middle of the Tiger River. And we would just, you know get high and lay on the rocks and watch the water fall off the rocks, which is incredibly dangerous and stupid. And I can't believe that all of us are still alive, you know, at least from that. 
uh, experience. Like none of us died in high school. In the words that. of Ron House, you can't kill stupid. You can't. And man, we were made out of rubber and did whatever we wanted. But, you know, that was, and Grafton was just, you know, rough and free and whatever. And so that was the mythology that I was in love with when I, when I had that band. And that's what I, what I named it after. And, and I guess I'm figuring this, figuring some of this out for the first time too, is that, uh, Grafton started with, uh, with you and Jason, with you and another drummer. Yeah. The, uh-huh. And then, um, Driftmouth was you and another drummer. That's the, true. Yeah. Um, and that's actually always been an important relationship for me going all the way back to my very first band was called I have mass. Uh, our drummer was, uh, Beth Schaffer. Uh, and that was a great, you know, she was only 16 or 17 years old when she, when she joined that band, I was only 19 or 20, but she was a killer drummer. And for me, the, the thing that I can't do uh, as a musician, I won't even attempt is to play drums. I can hear drums in my head. I can feel drums. I feel like the drums might be the most important instrument in a rock and roll band, but I can't play them. So I'm, always working with whatever drummer I'm in a band with really intensely to try to make some of these songs work the way that I think they should work. The, um, I mean, that you can't play drums is probably one of the things I like about you because in my (laughs) experience, people are always like, man, the drummer was such a psychopath. And I'm like, yeah, fucking, it's like, (laughs) it's like, oh, this kid who liked, you know, killed and tortured small animals is such a psychopath. It's like, yeah, who's drawn to playing the drums, but fucking psych, like, what's something that- I do know like two stable drummers out of the hundreds of drummers that I know, like two of them are like, what's know. What's something that's loud as hell and totally amusical? That's what I'm into, man. <laughs> like, I, I just want to hear stuff. Yeah. The, do you have something that's less musical and more violent? <laughs> Fuck your melody. <laughs> the, um, of course, Brad Sonarski's the, you know, the drummer is just the fucking fingernail of what he does. Oh, my the, God. Um, but, uh, so I guess talk me through the evolution of Driftmouth. You know, you sort of like, um, you it was a recording project. It was, it was basically yeah. a record. Uh-huh. Yeah. The um, or was it even a full length? Or it was. It, just was, a and it was maybe five or six songs. Okay. Uh, you know, a couple of covers, a couple of originals. Uh, but the song "Leverage Is Burning" was kind of the centerpiece of that uh, six song EP that I made. Uh-huh. Um, and so I've had that song since '05, and it just came out on the second Driftmouth record. Um, you know, it, it just took that long to find its place and, and to kind of settle and coalesce as a song, which is weird, but sometimes It's funny that, that people are always like, oh, you got to write some new songs. And I was like, no, I'm just going to fucking bring out these other ones that like, yeah, that I, I don't have any heard. new songs. Like, right. Every every new record has like three new songs and like 10 old ones, yep. you know. But the, that's good. The, um, they, they take a long time to mature, you know, sometimes. Yeah, and, you yeah. know, they have to find the right key. They have to find the right place that, you know, the the tempo and just the, I mean, hell, I changed key, the time signature on that song. You know, it was in three quarter. Yeah. It was it, it was a three quarter song when I wrote it, and it's now in four and feels a lot better. You know, um, and we had to edit it down. I think the original version of that song might it might be eight and a half minutes long. I mean, it's <laughs> it's like a long winding tale, and I had to like cut that down. Um, but that's something that as a songwriter, I've found I think maybe the hardest is because I'm trying to tell stories that are very complete because I'm a writer, I want to write a big complete story and then write a song about that story. Um, but in order to tell that story, I think fully, I have to have at least three verses and they have to, you know, be fairly inclusive verses. And, you know, if you have three verses and two choruses or maybe even three choruses in a song, now you're at five and a half minutes and nobody wants to fucking hear it. Yeah. So, you know, I have to walk that line sometimes with redaction. I, I like to pick on bands that I feel like, you know, are, um, are responsible for a lot of our suffering and the, and Dylan is definitely fucking one of them because, you know, Dylan's like, Oh yeah, I'm just going to fucking throw this nine minute jam out here with like seven, seven verses and seven choruses. And right. 600 the, words. Yeah. Um, this isn't a song. It's a think piece. Right. Uh, but, um, we'll, we'll play some music here. The, um, you know, on a podcast, uh, talk me through Loveridge is Burning, I guess. Maybe, I guess that'll be the first song that we'll play. All right. Uh, um, well, there's a, a, there's a crazy amount of history in this song for me personally. Um, my great-grandfather uh, 
Daddy Buck McNeese was on shift at Number Nine Mine when it blew up for the second time in 1968, and my dad's dad uh, was off shift, but you know, working at the mine at the time. Uh, that mine eventually became Loveridge uh, when they reopened it. They there was a, a, a new kind of uh, coal mining process that was being brought out in the 70s. And it's called long wall mining, where they scrape the, the coal off of the whole face of the seam for miles in these long kind of like brush strokes. Instead of just going at it with a continuous miner or shovels or whatever, they're scraping it right off the face of the seam. Long, mm-hmm. long, long strokes. And this mine was supposed to produce more coal than ever before. It was going to revitalize our area. And like, you know, Fairmont, the town that I'm from, was a, a coal mining boom town. At one point, it had more millionaires per capita than any other city in the world because of the coal barons and because of the extreme poverty that was everywhere but except at the coal barons' house. And so we were going to get some money, you know? This coal was going to clean the air. It was going to, yeah, it was going to revitalize the, the, the children forest. were going to have bowls of coal to eat Bigger for boobs. breakfast. It was going to be great. Yeah. The- and uh, instead, that mine caught on fire and burned for like 20 some years. And they ended up putting the fire out with a jet engine. Um, was the only way they could put it out. Uh, but that same mine has been a problem. You know, it's just a really gassy seam of coal. There's a lot of uh, methane gas there, and it keeps catching on fire and blowing up, killing people. Um, you'd think that we'd take the hint and just leave the fucking thing alone, but they keep going in and keep go- keep trying to get it. Well, as it turns out, the property that my mother's family had settled in the late 1800s and early 1900s butts up to the back of that property. So where I spent all of my childhood on that farm that you've seen pictures of, that is the next property over from what is now called Johnny Cake, but it's Flat Run, which is where the number nine mine portal in the Welland is. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those things kind of come together in my mind to show, you know, the evil corporate greed, the the pipe dream that is, you know, a community could actually thrive because of coal. They're never going to let, they're never going to give us any money. They're never going to share any of this shit with us, you know, Yeah. but they have baited us along as a community for, you know, hundreds of years with this. Oh, it's, it's going to be great for everybody. And the only person that it's ever great for is, you know, the guy that owns the mine. Yeah. The owner or the company right. or the, yeah. So leverage is burning is basically just, I mean, it's a metaphor that sits right there on your face and wiggles for how fucked up this, unchecked capitalistic system is the is there a personal narrative that runs through the that runs through the song as well is it about uh friends or family or or people or is is it focused specifically lyrically on the the mind itself and uh i used imagery from growing up and seeing like you know what my dad's life was like uh when i was a kid um you know he was a miner in that area at that time and expected to work at leverage um you know, as part of the, that operation. Uh, so I was able to kind of draw from his experience, like going through, uh, you know, a, a huge decline and, and a lot of strikes and a lot of, you know, shutdowns into uh, times of, you know, slightly more plenty. I mean, you know, there's, there's no doubt that there's some uh, benefit to a community to have uh, a large coal mining operation in it. There's, I mean, money is money, money is money. Right. And there's, it's it's always going to splash around a little bit. Right. But, um, so, and so there's lines in the song about, you know, new cars and, you know, there's a little bit of work and everybody gets a chance to, to have that kind of pride and feel good about doing a thing. And, you know, coal is a big business. I, I mean, I know that like, abstractly you know that but like being in in one of those communities when there's an operating coal mine it's a big fucking deal yeah you know like they're they're bringing in intel now to like the outside of columbus right and that's a huge fucking deal that's a big fucking deal to columbus because intel is there that's a huge amount of money that's the only thing that i can give you as a a, something comparable to to what it would be like to have a coal mine move into an impoverished appalachian yeah Community. The it's it's funny you know because the um all of my experience of 
uh, work, employment, unemployment, uh, the, sort of the structure of capitalism and stuff. It's biased, you know, it's um, informed by my own. One of the things I always bicker with people about online is, you know, your your anecdotal experience versus the empirical data. You know, right. uh, maybe you know somebody who got sick from the vaccine, but if you look at the data writ large, right. the the vaccine is a risk, but it's a much smaller risk than getting fucking COVID. The, um, so we take those smaller risks, you right. know, the, but you need to know the, but in my own life, the, um, it's, uh, the idea of people still mining coal blows my fucking mind, but it's, there's shitloads of people doing it. And like, you know, a ton of my uh, cousins were working on the, um, I guess this is maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, uh, they were working on the tar sands in, um, in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Right. And when, um, when that blew up, the, um, they all suddenly had hundred thousand dollar trucks. And um, new homes and second homes right. and boats. And, and that the, seems like a lot of money to people who come from poverty. And it yeah. is, you know. And now all the money's a, gone. And it's <laughs> all gone. And that's, you know, I, I got into a discussion the other day about uh, West Virginia in, in, in particular. Um, can you imagine what West Virginia would look like right now had there been any kind of wealth sharing from the late 1800s coal boom through now? In those communities, can you imagine how many museums and cities and new bridges and infrastructure and amazing colleges, universities, cultural centers would be in West Virginia had that stuff stayed there, had that money stayed in that state? It would be a completely different world. But instead, you've got a community of people who are basically just robbed and then left to deal with the trauma of that. And you're surprised that there's an opiate problem you're surprised that there's poverty you're surprised like that there's that's diabetes and you know what i mean depression you can't fucking be surprised about that shit it's what happens it's the aftermath of that kind of trauma that's one of the things that i find totally infuriating when people are shitting on um you know uh hillbillies in west virginia or fucking Pennsylvania or whatever you know whatever their right. um whatever the regional slur is is the have you ever driven through west virginia it's fucking beautiful where you can't see where they chop the top off the fucking mountain yeah. or the, you know, where they just um, you know, fucking cut the ass out of the, you know, the entire thing. You know, it's, um, it is beautiful country. And the, um, when you shit on rednecks and hillbillies and, uh, you know, uneducated folks who are uh, fucking selling drugs or running scams or whatever, you're shitting on people who have been systematically stripped of uh, a right to education, the, you know, basic human rights. Absolutely. Of, yeah. You know, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. You're shitting on poor people. You know, yeah. The, you're shitting on, on the weak, the oppressed, the... Um, all right. We're going to play uh, Lovers is Burning. I'm going to hit my asthma inhaler <laughs> again. <laughs> going to lay on the floor for five minutes. Humidity is real, buddy. We're going to be right back. Showed them the 
say when you when you started writing the the drift mode stuff you found you really sort of hit a vein there ooh, and ooh yeah that's a double that that's a double to, right there um, <laughs> but i i mean i feel like that inertial I- initial foray into more uh lyrically driven songs um it was something that you couldn't leave alone or that it, it wouldn't leave you alone that the, the sort of the songs called you back and you sort of demanded a new, a life of their own or how did, cause drift mouth is now a working band. Right. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I think that getting, you know, getting back into it towards the end of graft and I got frustrated, um, with that band, um, because of the way that it was, perceived and i know that that's not fair to anybody um but that's just how i felt that i don't know how anybody could get frust- frustrated with graft <laughs> <laughs> wasn't that band entirely frustration it was just a knife fight yeah um but you know i, I was trying to tell stories in that band and it, none of that really ever got across because of the way that i presented those stories i i think that that was a lot of fun and it was an important thing for me to do. And I'm, I'm happy that I did it. And I love, I love listening to those records in retrospect, but you know, I listen to those records and I still hear the stories that I was trying to tell in those songs rather than the spectacle or the, you know, whatever that band was to, <laughs> to everybody. Um, with drift mouth, I'm able to, uh, to tell the stories and it doesn't, there, there's less in the way. I think there's less theater in the way. Right. Uh, there's less, um, there's a lot less anger in the way, I guess. Um, instead of me just holding you by the throat and telling you what the fuck is wrong with everything, I'm just trying to explain it to you, man, over a beer. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to be like, hey, this is how I feel now. Like, this is what I'm doing. This is what, and this is how this character feels. You know, I'm, I'm still telling stories. Um, the way that I wrote for Grafton and 
somewhat the way that I write for Driftmouth is that I write short stories and then I try to make up songs uh, about those short stories, um, if that makes any sense. When I first started to write songs, I found myself cribbing off of like movies and, and books that I had read, um, you know, and, and trying to like rewrite those stories into songs, you know, that was just a way for me to like come up with ideas and stories and whatever. Um, and you know, not, not stealing like the, the full narrative, but you know, somebody did this thing and acted this way. I can take that and morph that into my own story that I'm going to write into the song. And then at some point I, realized that I could just do that with my own stories. And so I would write, and maybe not necessarily completely flesh out, but write a short story about, you know, a guy that goes to a laundromat to pick up the woman that runs it. You know, that's a, a short story that I wrote into uh, Last Night at the Bright and Clean, which is on the first Grafton record. And just like little character sketches, you know, and, and that mm -hmm. I've, I've always loved working in those short character sketch ideas because I think that those characters those kind of minor interactions sort of mundane things allow for people to project themselves onto it uh pretty clearly and they've always been the more interesting characters to me like the the little snippet guys the steve buscemi plays them in the movie guys you know what i mean like those right. are the those are the characters that really interest me so less the adam sandler characters. right exactly yeah. um so with drift mouth i'm 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 not just telling stories about coal miners and, and what happens to them. Uh, I do that a fair amount, but that it's not specific or, or exclusive to that. Uh, but I'm still telling, I'm still writing short stories and still creating like bigger narratives and then trying to find a way to tell those stories uh, quickly and effectively <laughs> uh, with, with as little heavy lifting as possible. It's so tricky, man, because the you, when I think about storytelling, it's like the for me, the book is always um, the primary source. That's there's for me, there is no way to unfold a narrative in um, in more thoughtful, slow motion, high definition detail than in a book. You're right. The um, however movies bring stories to life in ways that we could never imagine. And I, I can't deny the power of instantaneous 3d storytelling, you know, like there is in a movie, you know, the, I was thinking about this yesterday when we were working on the Bronco of like how hard the human brain prioritizes visual information that we have all these gauges and dials and led displays to, to give a visual, um, to translate um, the way the engine rumbles or not to a visual thing, so you you don't have to feel it in feel it in the vibration of the accelerator or the or listen to your motor. You, you can just look at a thing, and it's because right. we you know we prioritize visual information over everything else. Um, the but and then. Um, I've been particularly moved in my life by comic books, which are like the book of the movie in right. some ways, uh, you know, the yeah, like storyboard. Um, yeah. And then I think about actual books of movies of like, Oh, Supergirl, the book of the movie, you know, and she's like <laughs> shit like that. I got from the scholastic book club when I was a kid and I was like, man, I feel like I got ripped off like the, <laughs> um, and then with in a song, you're almost allowed like it's like a, a chick tract or like a matchbook. That's how much time you're given to tell a story. Right. And the, so it has to be, um, you know, the, it's so hard to write a song well and make it, um, make it instantaneous and lasting there, there's so much careful, um, you know, I think of like Breaking Bad where, you know, they're, they're making meth. And if, if you get the formulation, it's not like making cookies where like, oh, they're, these, these are crispier than they were last time, you know, because I got a phone call when they were in the oven or, you know, the, right. um, if you get the form, formulation off a little bit, 
it's like it explodes or it falls apart or it, you know, it doesn't gel. <laughs> yeah, you know? it, and it, it just doesn't work. And then it's a bad song. And holy shit, we've got enough of those. Like, yeah, trying to be evocative without being expository. Like that's the that's kind of the line that you have to walk when you're writing a song. Um, but to your point about movies versus books, especially uh, reading a book is meditating on the author's mind. You're you're right into whatever. You're literally, there's no difference between the author and you at that point. You're, you're reading words off of a page that that author put on that page. And that's, and then you get to take that blueprint and create the universe out of what's on that page. You know, there's no pictures in that book. You create every visual with your, with your mind, which makes you the director, which makes you the film scorer, which makes you the casting director. Like it makes you every, every person that creates a film, you take that, those roles when you read a book and you create that. Um, with a with a movie, all you can do is take it in. You can't. You're yeah. not hanging anything on a movie. You're yeah, not just taking. You're just watching. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you remember that that film later, and you kind of uh, then you're recreating it in your mind, and maybe you know your memory allows you to shift things around. You know, you've you've had that experience where you've seen a movie. And then you try to explain a scene to somebody who else is somebody else who's seen that movie. And they're like, that's not how that scene goes. Like, that's not what he says there because your brain has now started uh, to move it into how you want to experience it. Um, that there's a little bit of wiggle room in a movie, but a, a book is all on you. You are the creator of, of it off of the, you know, author's DNA that they put on that page. But with a song, with music, you get a little bit of visual aid from whatever lyric is there. And then you get the music and the music, the actual sounds and the rhythm and all of it, the dynamics of it are the emotional cues. That's what pushes you around. Yeah. And, but I don't think there's ever been a more effective way to communicate a human thought to another human mind than music. You, it's it's just the right amount of manipulative, a but thought also, or an emotion. Well, both. I mean, you know, and I think that an emotion is a thought, but that's a whole different <laughs> philosophical the, discussion. Because I, I was I was thinking while you were talking, I was like the, you know, we talk about how tricky it is to write a song and how hard it is, and it is because you do have to balance like a bunch of elements at the same time. You know, I was like um, listening to uh, Caitlin Krauss, your uh, your guitar player, her record, and the way in which she sort of balances. Uh, uh, complex thoughts through simple language. The um, because the, the f- people in the fucking bar have to be able to understand what you're saying, right? You know, the um, but when's the last time you were like walking around like, oh man, I've just had this fucking Emily Dickinson poem stuck in my head all day, <laughs> you know? And it's like, the, no, it doesn't. There's no um, there's no literary equivalent of an earworm like that, right? You know the um, and I, you know I was talking to Roberto Bantavena the. A uh, dude who wrote uh, House of Gucci, um, the, or he wrote the screenplay. Um, you know, he's a filmmaker, and you know, one of the things that he said was, um, "You take the soundtrack off of any movie and listen to the soundtrack, and you'll feel exactly. And you remove the soundtrack from the movie and just watch the movie, and it's like, you know, it's it's just like all the emotion is it, you you become a robot. It is it is." incredible it's almost unbelievable how much a soundtrack has to do with how a movie is accepted you can take a kind of shitty movie and put a great soundtrack on it and it's going to be well received you know people will respond to it i think of the award-winning judgment night (laughs) (laughs) That, you know, the, <laughs> are gone with the wind. You know, the, <laughs> yeah, fuck me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it, was, it was right there. I was just sitting there. I mean, look at the spaghetti westerns. I mean, just to be uh, yeah. serious about it for a second, like <laughs> if you take Ennio Maricone off of any one of those movies and just just play it for you, yeah. I mean, they're. They're not the worst movies ever made, but they're not what we think of. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. 
I was th- I was thinking too. I had a cassette of um, the Twin Peaks soundtrack, and I, I oh man, I, right, right. I don't even have to think about the songs. I, th- I have to just think about looking at the cassette, and I fe- I'm filled with. Uh, grief, longing, regret. Yeah, y- you know that's the, a dull ache of a soundtrack. When you're songwriting, who are the songwriters that that you look to, or uh, or or not not necessarily like look to? Even the I, I feel like it's sort of a retroactive thing that when you go back and look at the songs you've written, you're like, oh fuck, I I, I lifted that from this person, or uh, that, that that's when I was listening to this, and this mm-hmm. had a big influence on the. You know who are who are songwriters that you you feel have informed or influenced your work? Well, um, Towns Van Zandt is like the um, the north star uh, for me as far as trying to do what I was talking about earlier, <coughs> which is to convey an emotion from one human mind to the next um, or thought, however you want to see it. Um, so, looking at the way that he writes, um, I would say that the majority of the way that I write songs, if, if it doesn't come from him and my st- like studying how he worked, um, then it comes from William Carlos Williams or James Wright or, you know, modern poets because of the redactive system of trying to make, s- make something where nothing was before, but just not too much of it, you know? Right. Right. Um, you know, basically I start with a block I, you know, those short stories are like a big block of marble and then I just cut away at it until there's only what's necessary left in, in the middle. And hopefully by giving a whole lot of negative space that lets somebody listen to it and put themselves in the story. Like I always said that uh, nobody wants to hear my story because nobody gives a fuck about me. Everybody wants to hear their story because everybody gives a fuck about themselves. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a good thing. I'm not trying to it, qualify it, but it's just true. To, to carry the, you know, the metaphor of sculpture, like, it, you know, when you're looking at um, classical sculpture, mm-hmm. your experience of that sculpture is informed as you move around it in three years. It's, you know, it's a different sculpture from every angle. Right. You know, so it's all, it's all about the, the witness's perspective. Mm-hmm. And what that witness brings to it and hangs on it. Like you think of a, I think of a song or a poem or even a a story, a short story uh, where there's not too much detail. I think of those as like a a lattice on which the viewer, reader, listener can hang their own experiences. I have to build the framework, but the job is not complete until somebody listens to it and hangs their own experiences on it. And then it's, exactly what it is to them. Yeah. And that is what I think makes music important to people. When I walk into a Towns Van Zandt song the first time and I hear it and he's saying very little and I throw everything on it, I bring, you know, the, the music allows me to like tap into those little places in my brain where I keep those little packets of emotion. And when I hear that song and those few words, I can hang everything that I own on that framework and now it's my song now it's my story and i can hear that song and it's like he's singing to me you hear people say that all the time i was like he was singing right to me and it's because people want to hear their own story people want you to tell them their story and that's fine you know that's i think what we're here to do as as songwriters or whatever you write very specific stuff yeah but there are a lot of people like you and you have to take faith in that. And, you know, I know that you do, but I'm just saying in, in general, like as a writer, you have to take faith in the fact that there are people that are like you, that when you express those very specific emotions or ideas or thoughts, that you can still do it in a, in a way that's oblique enough that they can put their, their experiences on it and trust that they're going to be able to do that, you know? The two responses the i i do always feel like i'm um like my songs are like a fucking model airplane enthusiast convention you know that it's just like very very narrow 
um, a very small demographic that is very passionate about their uh, their model trains or whatever the fuck you know the um, it's better than civil war reenactment. <laughs> yes. Um, and then I'm always surprised at how wrong I get it because I feel like I'm writing for a bunch of like old white men still wearing black hoodies, you know, the, um, but when we played at the union the other night, I was at the merch table and a young woman who was probably 22, if that, you know, came up to me and was like, man, that, that song paper plates, like, man, I totally felt it. Like the, I felt like you were talking to me and I was like the, did somebody like slip you a 20 to come and like, give the, you know, fucking, you know, rattle the old man's cage. But you know, no, it landed with her, you know, and it, um, it, it hit. Um, so the, I think part of it is just, um, like what you said, you know, negative space, but, but then in the space that you do use in constructing a, so- a song, there needs to be, uh, specificity is the is the is the key to universal universality the that if you write about a um you know an emotion or an idea with with an enough um specificity and impact then it will translate right. to, to everybody and anybody yeah the um the other thing is you you didn't say uh when i first hear a towns van zant song you said when i first walk into a towns van zant song the oh, which yeah. is very telling the that you describe it as like like walking into this cabin mm-hmm. or something like that right no, that yeah. you're um we went from an, an analogy of like circling around a statue to uh being enveloped by the world of the song yeah yeah the, for sure you know which yeah. is uh absolutely one of the things that he does you know incredibly well um donna is always on my case my partner donna uh she she's like why don't you listen to music because i i don't like i don't i don't just put on some tunes and do the dishes you know i I just don't um music is so fucking overwhelming for me Mm -hmm. uh that i like that's what i'm doing if if i'm like i don't listen to music when i drive jesus i can't remember us ever listening to music in the car no we don't i don't (laughs) listen to music when i drive um yeah now there's a little bit of 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 habit to that too when i when I first started traveling around the country, I did that before I had a band. I had a job driving a truck from Buffalo, New York to the West Coast. It wasn't a big rig. It was a 20-foot uh, moving truck. But I took these empty moving vans from Buffalo where they were built, and I would deliver them to the West Coast and fly home. Those trucks did not have radios in them. So my first couple of years of uh, songwriting like that was me in those trucks with no music filling up the void by screaming what became the first Grafton record mm-hmm. and a lot of the second one um, and writing those songs in my head as I, as I just drove around the country and jotted down notes in the trip, triple a trip takes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, dang, we, old. that's some age shit right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, Ooh, <laughs> you just gave away Ooh. too much information right there. <laughs> the, tr- the old trip tick. Right. And, um, the I'm reaching fucking uh, code red with COVID <laughs> fatigue again already. The um, the song I want to play next is uh, "Ballad of Frank Hayes." The can you because this is a song to which I have a uh, nearly psychotic level of attachment. The can you unpack this song for me? Uh, yeah. Um. Let me uh, let me tell you a little bit about the writing of it, and then I'll just tell you about how the story yeah, yeah. goes. Um, I was on my way to meet up with some friends, and I happened to have uh, – I, I told you I don't listen to music, but I did have some sports talk radio on the <laughs> Man, <laughs> in the car that day. The triptych of radio. Right there, <laughs> right, Jesus exactly. Christ. Uh, I believe it was Dan Lebitard. I don't listen to a whole <laughs> lot of sports talk radio, and I cannot stand Dan Lebitard, but it was on, and I just was too lazy, I think, to change the channel. Um, but he and his guests were, were talking and laughing from the minute that I keyed into the car about this guy who had died riding a horse, but won the race. And they were laughing about it and they thought it was this really funny, funny thing. And the more they talked about it and I 
the the more of the story that I heard, I I started to cry. I mean, I actually like physically was weeping in my car driving down the road, just listening to the story of this man. And um, I I started to hear the song within minutes after turning off the radio and getting back to my silent quiet place. And for the next three or four hours, that song just kind of ran through my head while I was hanging out with my friends. And I even had to warn them. I was like, guys, you're going to think that I'm, that I'm crazy here, but you're going to see me talking to myself for the next couple hours while this is happening. I can't, you know, and sometimes songs do come to me like that where I'm just like kind of powerless to stop it or whatever. It doesn't happen very often. I wish it happened more often. I think the better ones happen that way where it's more like I'm hearing it than I'm writing it. It's more like transcription. But so the story of Frank Hayes is that uh, in 1907, I believe it was, uh, this horse trainer who had always wanted to be in the game, he'd always wanted to be a jockey, he'd always wanted to be a rider, but he was too big, he wasn't talented enough. For whatever reason, he was relegated to the role of stableman. Um, but he loved he loved the he loved it so much that he was willing to take a lesser job just to be in the game. Um, finally got a chance. The jockey that was riding uh, their team's horse was sick and couldn't make a, a, a race at Belmont that was coming up in the coming weeks. And they gave him the opportunity to ride. And so he cut weight uh, for two weeks straight um, in order to, to, to make this race happen. And he did. And he finally got his chance to, to ride. It was his first time. Uh, and it was a steeplechase. It's not like just an oval track race. It's a steeplechase. So there's jumping and water and the, you know, the whole deal. Uh, and he died in the middle of that race, well, towards the end of that race. And um, the horse won with him still somehow on its back. And so he won the only race that he was ever able to, to run. Um, and that story just kills me because I know so many yeah. people, you know, in my life, the circus that we're in, traveling around the country in beat up old junker vehicles, getting paid $30 and a pizza to play to 10 people or a, a bartender. We're, we love it so much that we're going to do that. You know, we just love it so much. And this is akin to like, here's your shot kid. Here's Madison square garden, yep. you know? And, uh, yeah, it just, I love it because, you know, here's the guy who's made of strong stuff. Who's different than most everybody else. Um, and you know, at, at one point I, I threw in a line about, he, he looked at the stands for his mother when he realized that he was going to lose, you know? Um, it's just, and then the the name of the horse really is Sweet Kiss, and that's that's actually like a, a hist historical fact. So, um, I wrote the song based on the few facts that I had from that brief interaction with Dan Lebetard, and then I went back to the Wikipedia page to like do some fact checking, and at, everything that I had written lined up with what was real. Wow. And I didn't have to change anything to like fit factually into a, you know, I could have taken some artistic license here and there. And, you know, obviously the line about waving to his mother, I don't know if his mother was even there, but the things that I did write out were borne out by the facts. And so I just, that was it. It was written. It was done. Yeah. You know, no notes, no more revisions. This is the song. So it's, Dude, it's such a powerful song. You know, I mean, it's, and it describes a moment that I think we see again and again in narrative. You know, the, there's this great Russian proverb, which is that um, uh, one day, one day out of the year, every rake becomes a rifle for a moment. You know, the, which is that, you know, you know, and Andy Warhol's thing was everybody's famous for 15 minutes, you know, the, but, but it's sort of like you, you live through this completely mundane existence um, sort of 
waiting for your chance. You know, the, I could be somebody, I could do a thing. I, you know, I, I have ideas too. I have dreams too, you know, like just, you know, just give me a shot, just give me a shot. And the, and we conceptualize it, you know, in, in two ways, you know, one is that like you rise to the moment, you know, and the, like you pull the guy off the fucking subway tracks or whatever the, um, or you don't, you know, in Lord Jim, you know, he's provided, you know, this moment of, uh, potential heroism and instead he chickens out, you know, and he's just like, I'm going to leave these people to their death. Um, but the third option <laughs> is that when your, your moment comes, you take that moment and you, you fucking do it. You do the thing, you know, the, and, and, and also fail, you know, and have that, to have that be your, um, your greatest and last moment right? in the, um, yeah, no, it's incredibly powerful. I mean, the, 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 the flipping of what is failure and was, what is success just during the, the time that it took to make that ride, um, to go from the success in, in like a Rocky Balboa kind of way is like, I'm here, you know, I made it, I'm doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And then to realize that he's failed by being so far behind so early and, and, and then to, to be like, well, you know, it's still, I, I still won. I'm still here. I still got to do it. And then to, to not, to, to pass away to die. And then, moments later snag that actual victory and never know it it's just yeah it it really it, it brings into perspective like expectations and perceptions of success and um you know what any of it all might mean and it, what it what it means i think is just what you take from it what you've put into it and what you expect to get back out of it that's that's what it means right on um so here is Ballad of Frank Hayes. Twenty to one, that's long odds to run. For a lifelong horse trainer and an old stableman. On a mare they call Sweet Kiss. That never has won well, It's the old steeple chase Come on son Frank Hayes was born near us back on the The grace and the courage you lack The sweat of his brow Has broken his back But he finally waits at the start line
When I was um, when I was in the process of like breaking up with Maddie, or like I knew that that relationship was over, and then I just um, was like like getting ready to leave town. The I was listening to that album again and again and again, and every time that fucking line, um, you know, he looked to the stands for his mother came on, I would just cry, mm-hmm. and it's like, a, yeah, that's. <laughs> That's why you don't listen to music in the cars. These people don't need to fucking see you crying. Right. <laughs> well, I don't need a wreck because I was in a different world. You know, that's the thing about about music for me is that it's so transportative. Um, I mean, I if I listen to music in the car, I will come out of screaming and yelling along with the song and thinking about things and crying and whatever, and I'll be 15 miles past my exit. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know? And like, oh, oh, fuck, I did it again, you know? Yep. It's just dangerous for me to have music on um, when there's anything else to do. <laughs> yeah. Especially if it, if it involves, like, moving. So talk to me about, uh, well, I'll intro this part. The um, People make assumptions about writers. The one is that it's okay to ask a writer, uh, "How's the writing going?" It's never. <laughs> that's never okay. The um, instead ask somebody, um, uh, "Please tell me. Please detail for me your entire sexual history, including uh, you know your kinks, what you're into and not into, with uh, contact information for all of your sexual partners, so I can verify it." Because that's less intrusive and the um, easier uh, emotional terrain to navigate <laughs> than to ask a writer how the writing is going. The other thing is uh, writers don't want to read your fucking writing. The yeah. it's um, if you're friends with a writer, it's fucking rude The don't do that. Um, it's that we hate writing. We hate reading. We hate literature. And, and, and more than anything else, we're judgmental pricks and the we fear uh, nothing worse than the few genuine friendships that we've been able to uh, to maintain uh, you know in a life of terror and anxiety will be complicated by you asking us to read your writing us reading your writing and then telling you honestly that it's fucking dog shit and th- then your feelings will be hurt um so the I'm, I'm really reeling them in with this one, aren't I? <laughs> or worse, that you read it and it's better than your shit, and then the like oh, absolute yeah. bug-eyed fury that comes from that. Yes. So this is the, <laughs> so. Um, Lou asked me to read a story of his years ago, and with uh, every caveat and qualification, I said that I would, and he sent it to me, and uh, and it was fucking great. It was really good. And I I'd, I'd actually just gotten out of teaching at Yale, and I was like, God damn it! I wish I'd had a story this good to talk about when we were at Yale. Um, the, and now finally through a million different sort of zigs and zags through the forest of, uh, publishing or not, um, that story's coming out. So, uh, Jesus Lou, where'd you learn, learn to write like that? (laughs) I learned it by watching you. (laughs) No, you fucking did it. That's That's exactly what you didn't do. (laughs) Um, I, I read a lot. Um, and I, I've been an avid reader since I can remember. Um, and I think that the, uh, just paying attention to storytelling is, is how I've learned how to write. Um, just trying to pay attention to what's important in a story and trying to figure out what makes me feel a certain way, what imagery works with what emotional content and how paying attention to how people talk, people paying attention to how, um, you know, real life happens to, to folks, you know, um, I, and I was surprised that 
you enjoyed that because that is the first um, thing that I wrote, like front to back all the way through with the intention of publishing it at some point. You know, it's the first time that I sat down and thought, this is a story that I might try to show people. And I think you were the first person that I showed it to. I'm 90% certain that that's uh, outside of Donna. I think Donna read uh, a couple of the first uh, sections as I was writing it. And then, and then so I think you were the first person outside of the house. If, if you're um, ingracious enough to, uh, to write well and to ask a writer friend to read your work, don't hit a fucking home run your first time at bat <laughs> unless – Unless you intend to Frank Hayes your way out of this world. <laughs> like, yeah, here this it is. It, First, dude. last, best, only. Right. Goodbye. <laughs> like the, this could be the farewell tour right here. Good night, um, New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so sometime at the end of this month, um, SVJ Lit is going to be uh, serializing this short story. I wrote it. It's, you know, long short story, I guess, uh, which doesn't quite fit their format, but they're going to break it down into into sections and release it weekly, I think starting here at the end of uh, August. So, um, and yeah, that might be, that might be it. I might just have to walk off into the sunset after that. The, um, was, you know, was the, the process of writing that story versus writing a song the, was it radically different for you? Was it something that just came to you? The, did you sort of like, sweat over it for a long period of time and, and i mean also tell people you know sort of what the story's about without giving the whole thing away yeah sure um the the process of fiction writing for me is different than songwriting but it's um you know i i basically had an idea for a guy um i, I an idea for a character and i just kind of sat there and watched him do stuff for a while and wrote it down i don't know uh, a better way to to describe the process there. I just like hung out with this guy and kind of watched him from the wall and watched what he did and got into his head and, and watched some of his memories and wrote those down. And when I was done with all of the initial writing, you know, the big block, uh, then I put on my writer hat and went back to it and, and got to work making a story out of what I had seen, I guess. Um, so, you know, I, and this, this story is fairly dark. It's, uh, it's, it was actually written to be a horror story. Uh, uh, another friend of ours, uh, had, had, um, had asked for submissions to this thing. And that's kind of outside of my wheelhouse. Like the horror fiction writing thing is, was so far afield from what I normally do that I wanted to give it a shot. It just seemed novel and it seemed like a good way to like kind of spur uh, some creativity. So I just, I did it. And once I got done with it, I, I wasn't completely embarrassed by it. And that's why I sent it to you. I should have been too embarrassed to send it to you, but I, you know, <laughs> hubris being what it is, I, I did. I sent it, sent it to you. And the fact that you weren't completely repulsed by it, <laughs> was encouraging to me. So, well, I mean, I, I think you felt comfortable sending it to me because you, uh, you'd had zero experience, say reading any of my shit. <laughs> so you didn't know what a fucking hot shot writer I am. So you had, you didn't, you didn't realize how hopelessly outnumbered, outgunned and outclassed you were. <laughs> and that's yeah. why you felt okay sending it to So me. you know about the coral snake and the rings or the, uh, king snake, like, yes. uh, you know, I didn't know which stake I was I was handling at the moment. So, and it's you know, ignorance is bliss. <laughs> so you were like down the hatch, right? With yeah, both of them. <laughs> both of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a profoundly dark story, and the I, you know, I would urge everybody to. Uh, we'll have links as soon as um, as soon as links are available. The, I would I would definitely urge people to check it out. It you know it reminds me of the um, you know sort of like literary hor horror of Cormac McCarthy. Um, the you know with um, this the, like splashier stuff that I really enjoyed when I was a kid. That's also still great writing of like you know the Stephen King or you know particularly like the Richard Bachman books before right. he got all. Uh, 
gacked up on cough syrup and not that there's anything wrong with getting gacked up on cough syrup (laughs) (laughs) as this week will attest oh god yeah the um where um so what's going on these days with uh with the band with music with recording with writing the um where what have you been up to in these last couple of years of fucking darkness and stagnation <laughs> and, uh, and what's, what's coming up? Well, we had a little, uh, Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football routine, um, as, as I'm sure a lot of people did, but, um, so drift mouth for a, a while was a three piece, uh, that was me and Jess Kaufman and David Murphy. Um, Jess Kaufman was playing bass and singing harmonies, uh, Murph on drums and I was handling all the guitars for the first time. And we went into the studio in uh, 2019 and we made this album uh, called Leverage is Burning. And I had to learn how to play lead guitar for this. And I you know, just had to pick together. I, I was such a poor lead guitar player at that point that I, I just had to note by note write out these little melodies and then learn how to play them and it was painstaking and it was a terrible year for me. It was embarrassing because I was so far behind as far as guitar playing went. Um, and, you know, spent a, a, the better part of, of, of a year in the studio making this record. And then on the, the day that I tracked the basics for the, the last song on that album, which is a bad song, I literally finished the last notes on an acoustic guitar. Joe Veers, the engineer... Uh, got into the cans and said uh, they, his son was working for the Columbus Blue Jackets at that point. And he got, got in the cans and he goes, they just kicked everybody out of nationwide arena. We have to go. And it was almost like, you know, a war had started or a bomb had dropped. And it was at that moment, everything changed and all of our plans to put that record out and the tour that we had booked to, to follow you know, down to Austin and all that stuff, just everything just went out the window. And um, so we took a, a beat and waited to put the record out for a little while, thinking that maybe it would only last six or eight months. And yep. so we ended up putting it out in the fall and, you know, nothing happened with it. It's unfortunate because it is a, a, a culmination of a, a lot of long-term projects are in parts of that record, uh, leverage is burning. As we talked about earlier, that song had been a song for 15 years by the time it was released and was finally in its, you know, it, in the form that I want it to be in. Um, but it, it became very tough to get press and to get any kind of momentum behind a, a, a new release at that point, because, you know, nobody was really talking about music at that point, which is totally I, understandable. I remember too, that you, you know, you had this big tour booked, and then yeah. a, a couple of times, right? Yeah, we, we and booked it like and, then, to, and, and then we, you know, the March uh, 2020 stuff happened. And then we had it booked again for uh, the following year. Uh, we had a stop at the Carnegie Hall in Lewisburg, West Virginia. We had, uh, you know, a couple of really cool dates with John Miller. And we all got COVID at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it, it's, it just has felt like, you know, swimming in quicksand uh, to, to a degree with the release of that album. But during that period of time, uh, Jess Kaufman uh, left the band. Um, and so we picked up Nate Bright uh, playing bass, um, who's an old buddy of mine down here in Athens. And, you know, I relocated to Athens. Uh, we bought this house and this property and this cabin. And um, we've been working on that. And during all of these other big projects, I've been putting the band back together. And at some point while at a party, I met Caitlin Krause and uh, started talking to her about music and what she was up to. And would you like to join up with uh, with what we're doing? And so she's been playing rhythm guitar and, and singing harmonies uh, for about the, the past eight or nine months. And it's really come together quite well. Um, and I'm in that situation as a writer, you know, as a songwriter, especially it's easier for me to hold on to, uh, fiction that I've written, uh, short stories and things like that. It's easier for me to just write it 
and shelve it. But with with music, I'm writing, and I I just want to get more stuff out all yeah. the time. Um, you know, I I was I was on a, a year and a half sc- cycle for a long time to put out a record every eighteen months or so, and right now it's been longer than that. And I would like to get another record out uh, as soon as possible. I I probably have material for three um, that's kind of bouncing around, like we were just talking about. I have two new songs and 18 old ones. Let's get this shit out of here. Yeah. Um, but now that I've got that lineup, which I think is really strong, uh, we can have four part harmonies. If we want, we can have, you know, bigger, more layered things. And, you know, I've spent the last couple of years wood shedding and playing with a, a, a bar band every other Tuesday down here at Tony's bar in Athens uptown, learning how to play lead guitar. And so I'm much more comfortable in that role now. And I am really looking forward to putting together another 12 songs here in the next few months and to start rehearsing that. But, you know, we've, we've had to do a lot of going backwards and teaching, you know, Caitlin and Nate, those older songs just to get up to the point where we can go play shows. Yeah. So now that we've got, you know, a set that we've been banging out for several months, um, we can kind of move forward, I think. And I'm really looking forward to what's next with Caitlin and Nate and their input that'll be fresh to the thing, as well as working with Murph as closely as I've been for the past, you know, four years now. Are you um, are you gearing up to make any new recordings or the or you're you're still trying to shine a light on? Yeah, we're still leverage. we're we're going to be, you know, right now the focus is still leverage. I mean, it's not the same it's lineup. Still the new record. It's still the new record, yeah. though, and you know, I know that most people haven't heard it. Um, so th- there will probably be uh, more videos. We have a video for um, uh, the Ghost of Paul Weaver, which is an animated. Uh, video that I think came out really well. John Burns made that. that. Video. Yeah. Um, and then we have the Tennessee Highway video, which was kind of cobbled together from a live video that we were supposed to to do that didn't quite meet expectations. So I just kind of cut it and spliced it and retimed it and, and made a video out of it. Uh-huh. Um, so there will probably be maybe two and maybe even three more uh, single releases and, and videos from leverage is burning before we do something else uh-huh. um, as far as releasing any, any new material. But, you know, in the, in the meantime, while we're still promoting leverage is burning, I'll be hopefully making a new record. So, and I, I hope to be doing it here and in the, the building next door as well. Awesome. The, uh, what about uh, stories? If, if you have uh, something publishing, finally, you have to have the next thing ready to pitch. Right. Um, well, the, the first Grafton record, um, was almost a hundred percent based on short stories that I had written, at least sketched out and have, you know, the plots in my, in my head uh, from that. So I have about 10 short stories that have been percolating for right around 20 years that I'm pretty familiar with and should just sit down and, and jot down at some point um, and get those out Um, there, you know, just rough little character sketches, but really just gritty looks at the way that desperate people behave and move through uh, their environment and their world. And uh, yeah, I, I think I could probably get those down as a collection, um, you know, pretty quickly. So I, I think that this fall and into the beginning of this winter is my timeline for, for really getting those down. Um, if I need to get them out more quickly than that, I, I suppose I could be motivated, but that's you know ideally yeah. for me that would be the the timeline. Awesome. Well, I look forward to not reading them. Yeah, um, I, I won't send them. <laughs> the, uh, pick a uh, pick a song to get us out of here and and set it up for us. Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go with the book of Allison because uh, all this sniping. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if your listeners are exactly familiar with why I'm I'm taking this abuse, but <laughs> trust me, I deserve it. Um, so Mishkin and I were hanging out one time, and uh, <laughs> here I'm speaking to you, dear listener. Uh, <laughs> Mishkin's not even in the room at this point. Um, he's heard this story. And, you know, he's, he's got this tattoo of Allison on his chest. And uh, I just asked him, I was like, hey, uh, what's the story with Allison? You know, you want to you tell me about that? And he's like, 
motherfucker, it is time for you to read one of my books. <laughs> and uh, rather than do that, which I never have, uh, and at this point I can't. <laughs> <We're> just, <laughs> <laughs> you, lose a, you lose a bit. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Uh, rather than, than read anything that he's written, uh, I just made up a story of my own about somebody named Allison and how they might relate to somebody like Mishka and wrote a song about it, and it's called The Book of Allison. What's, what's so fucked up the, about this song is, I mean, not just the, the rank disrespect <laughs> <laughs> with which you, you the, 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 uh, the deep, enduring insult that you heap upon an old friend is uh, <laughs> that um, I played it for Allison, and, like, you got it right. That's and it's... Uh, it's been so weird, like being on tour together and to hear you play this song again and again, you know, night after night, the, uh, in a seemingly endless series of nights, <laughs> the, um, and, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like a, you know, a painting or something that you just stare at and it, um, you know, what, what we were talking about, you know, the sculpture, you look at, see it from a different perspective and, and the sculpture itself seems to change, not just your perception of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, the uh, and, and you know one night it it does seem like uh like you did go and read the fucking book and that um you know that because it it does describe my relationship with Allison and, and it's my life and then listening another night it's um it's not about me or her at all it's about you and it's about your life and the um to have that experience of uh of like our lives blending or blurring together in song is uh, incredibly rewarding. Um, so I guess thanks for not reading my book. And the, <laughs> well, I think I've gotten to know you a lot better without having re- read your book. So. <laughs> <laughs> a powerful non-endorsement for fucking <laughs> the... <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Uh, Lou, thanks so much for taking time to do the podcast. And Love you, buddy. Letting me letting me be uh, incredibly sick uh, down here. <laughs> I'm glad that you're starting to come around from it. I, it was touch and go there for a while. Yeah. I was I was looking for a shovel that was large enough <laughs> to take care of this situation. Should I come down here and find you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it'll happen one day. <laughs> All right. Share of true romance. I made a pretty good living on second chances. It's a long way down. It's a long
Boops. Thank you so much for listening. I know there's uh, there's a million podcasts out there. We appreciate you uh, you spending your time with us. The um, if you're digging the show, if you're enjoying it, if you if these conversations uh, move you, make you laugh, annoy you, piss you off, um, please take a minute to uh, to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, it helps us grow the show and it helps other people find it. Um, if you'd like to hear bonus episodes, song demos, just sort of uh, ranting off the cuff uh, conversations, all sorts of different uh, bonus material, writing advice, uh, personal blog posts and stuff like that, uh, go to patreon.com slash Mishka Shabali. Uh, we will be having monthly episodes up there with my mom and I answering uh, questions from readers and there's all kinds of good stuff there. Uh, thank you so much for supporting.